Okay, so in the last video, um, we had gotten so far as uh, to what we're reading, um, analyses concerning passive and active synthesis, lectures on transcendental logic by Edmund Husserl, translated by Anthony J. Steinbach, 2001, into English. And uh, so far where we are reading the first part of the translator's introduction, on the hist it's on a historic historically and conceptually situ situating us uh, on the work, and uh, we're getting into the second reason as to why this, why these lectures by Husserl are entitled passive synth the passive synthesis lectures, even though that wasn't the name that he wanted to give them. When uh, why the original, um, uh, the original person who had compiled these lectures uh, in German entitled them the the analyses concerning passive synthesis. Uh, this is the analysis concerning passive and active synthesis, which means that it's the original German work plus more supplementary notes and things like that, and then translated into English. So it's actually more, more has more content uh, than Husserliana 11, which was the lectures on passive synthesis. Um, so right now we're going to find out the, 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 the philosophical reason why the title of this book, why the, the title of the original lectures, which make up part of the main part of this book, were entitled passive, the Lectures of Passive Synthesis. Or he says, B, <clears throat> the title, however, is not the sole reason for these lectures to have acquired their acclaim as the passive synthesis work. While the issue of passive synthesis is a fundamental one and does occupy a large portion of Husserl's investigations in Husserliana 11, the context in which the lectures unfold is a broader one. This context, as intimated above, is transcendental logic. Husserl's, formal, uh, Husserl's work, Formal and Transcendental Logic, which was published in 1929, was conceived as an introduction to phenomenology, and as such it joins the logical investigations, Ideas 1, and is later joined by Car the Cartesian Meditations and the Crisis as introductions to phenomenology. Husserl felt the need to continually begin anew uh, his, in his project. In distinction to, e.g., or for example, Ideas 1, the way into phenomenology, so the way into phenomenology, takes place via the natural attitude, in particular, as it is, uh, as it is functional in the mathematician and the logician. So we begin with the natural attitude of the logician and the mathematician which is the, 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 the naive attitude that we take that the world exists and everything, you know, things are real and et cetera. The, norm, the normal attitude we take, we believe, just sort of have faith in, in the world and all that. Um, while formal logic understood both as the apophantics of propositions and deductive relations, as well as the formal ontology of individual objects, while formal logic serves as the starting point of analysis, it cannot be said as cannot be seen as self-sufficient. Formal logic requires an investigation into subjective accomplishments that constitute mathematical and logical truths. It requires a transcendental logic. So, Piro, if you're watching, you might want to be be interested in this. <clears throat> um, but even this, writes Husserl, demands a deeper founding. For as, the, for as a critique of the limits and capacities of logical reasoning, a transcendental logic must understand how a streaming egoic life of consciousness can be constituted as a true being, and it must do this by appealing to a theory of experience and actuality that founds active cognition and its ideal objects, such as numbers and log, you know, logical operators, things like this. He's trying to get to the, the foundation, which is, he thinks, consciousness. The foundation of all of all of our knowledge as far as log, logic and mathematics go. He wants to figure out how a world, uh, how, uh, how, uh, how a streaming in time, a temporal, egoic life of consciousness can be constituted as a true being, something that can be, can be reflected upon. Uh, and it must do this by appealing to a theory of experience, which is what he's trying to uh, develop. Thus, when considering the function of the analyses in this broader context, we are witness to a peculiar but almost typical phenomenological movement 
a zigzag, if you will. Even though Husserl understood his, his work, Formal and Transcendental Logic, as another introduction to phenomenolo phenomenology, and even though this work followed his lectures making up the analyses, Husserl's Formal and Transcendental Logic itself can be read as an introduction to the project of the analyses. Let me explain. So an introduction to this work, even though it actually was published after, or, yeah, it was published after this work. Uh, it can be read as an introduction to this work. Uh, let, let him explain, he says. Husserl's actual introduction to these lectures given in 1920 slash 1921, uh, which are included in, the, in here as the, in the English edition uh, as main text part one, but published only as an appendix to Husseliana uh, 17, formal, formal and Transcendental Logic. Anyway, Husserl's actual introduction to these lectures given in 1920 and 1921 begins with a preliminary consideration of the term logic. Tracing the term logic back to its Platonic founding and to its Greek roots in logos, and then to its more original logos as, as gathering together, as a translation of it, uh, or I think logoi, I'm not sure what that, uh, anyway, as, as gathering together, he's tracing back the roots of the term logic, back to the Greeks, and uh, as gathering together and, and expounding upon, so it has two, two more original Greek meanings, which, which are translated gathering together and expounding upon. Husserl detects in logic a vocation of the critical justification of reason, and as such, a vocation to be to be the science of all sciences. As a radical and universal a priori theory of science, logic is not to be understood merely as an axiomatic and formalistic deductive system, formed by abstracting general traits from existing or past sciences. For intrinsic to all factual sciences at our disposal is an animating teleological orientation. Kind of reminds you of Plato. Anyway, from the, the idea of the good. So even if we never encounter this, this teleological idea, which is animating all of, our, all, of, all of science, which you know, sort of pushes us to do this. Anyway, uh, even if we never encountered this, en encounter this teleological idea as such, it nonetheless functions guidingly and efficiently, even if implicitly, when we practice science or operate from theoretical interest. If we find today that the sciences treat their objects of study in a detached, particularized, and fragmented manner, this would only be an expression of the way in which the particular sciences themselves become detached from the aim, sense, and possibility of genuine science. That's in quotes. So Husserl thinks that if we find today that sciences treat their objects of study in a detached, particular, particularized, and fragmented manner, this would only be an expression of the way in which the particular sciences themselves have become detached from the aim, sense, and possibility of genuine science. They, they the particular sciences, have lost their se the sense of their own orientation that ultimately gives them meaning and to which they refer back as indexes. Yet, despite the fact that the particular sciences have abandoned their own normative sense, a phenomenological investigation will not simply do away with the sciences in their current cultural forms. They cannot simply be passed over in a fundamental analysis. For as scions of the instituting idea of, lo of logic, the special sciences still harbor their internal sense even in their self-forgetfulness. By examining them, and more specifically, by examining the science of logic as it has been handed down to us, we can gain a clue, a leading clue, to logic's vocation of critical self-justification as the universal theory of principles and of norms of all sciences. So it seems obvious that Husserl is not talking about here like uh, logic as we know it. He's talking about logic and he's going back to the primordial roots of when logic started with Plato as a sort of a critical endeavor, a critical philosophical pursuit which was um, uh, you know sort of guiding and affecting the the, uh, the the motivations and the aims of science in the first place so he's going back and saying okay how did we get to this 
this detached, particularized science that that treats its objects as fragmented and uh, you know how, how you know and which which are, are forgetful of their own origins and their own history and their own founding motivations. How do we get back to that? And that's what he's doing. He's going back to the beginning of science, and he says science is originally logic, but it's not formal logic. It's some other kind of lo transcendental logic, he's going to call it. But it's not just symbol, you know, um, the writing down of symbols, which stand in for abstract terms. Uh, you're, we're going to find out. It's actually, a, 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 he, says, uh, he says that it is the um, it is gathering together and expounding upon, it, and Husserl detects in logic, in the history of logic, a vocation of the critical justification of reason, and as such, a vocation to be the science of all sciences, as a radical and universal a priori theory of science, logic is not to be understood merely as an axiomatic and formalistic deductive system formed by abstracting general traits from existing or past scientists. sciences, for intrinsic to all factual sciences at our disposal is an animating teleological orientation. That's what we want to figure out. What's the motivation? What's be, what is this animating teleological orientation which first of all motivates all, all through all of history has motivated science and, 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 and objective truth within the search for truth. So this, the self -forgetful, the, this self forgetfulness and possibility of recovery, which comes with it, however, is not as innocent and facile as um, facile as it seems. The tragedy we currently face, laments Heidegger, H laments Husserl. Uh, so, so that he says that there, there, there's a crisis or a tragedy that, that we face because our sciences are in this are in this um, state. He says the self forgetfulness and and the possibility of recovery, however, is not as innocent and fa and facile as it seems. The tragedy we currently face, laments Husserl is that the sciences have inverted the original relation between logic and science such that, one, the sciences have made themselves autonomous in this ostensible, mystifying self-sufficiency and groundlessness. Two, they have become splintered in relation to each other. And in this process, three, logic has been transformed into a sub-discipline of the sciences, a pragmatic technology borrowing its methods from mathematics, becoming a limited theoretical instrument brushed aside with scorn. So the, the, the relation between sciences and logic had been inverted. Originally, it was, uh, uh, logic was not, uh, the sciences were not autonomous, um, and logic was not a sub-discipline of the sciences, uh, just some pragmatic, practical technology that we could use. Uh, which borrowed its methods from mathematics. No, originally, logic was something else. So he continues. It is precisely through this inversion and its ramifications that the sciences have lost their internal sense and landed in a kind of self-forgetfulness of scientific objectivism. Quote, In other words, logic, which was originally the torchbearer of method, and which claim to be the pure doctrine of principles of possible knowledge and science, lost this historical vocation and understandably remained far behind in its development. End quote. The paradox here is that the autonomy of the sciences for, from logic, logic as a justifying system of principles of all objective justification, the paradox here is that the aut autonomy of the sciences from logic has only a putative autonomy, one which exacerbates the science's inability to emerge as self-sufficient, since the sciences are completely ignorant of their own sense and without foundation. So Husserl writes, <clears throat> while at first we novices are filled with enthusiasm in engaging in the positive sciences, we end up being deeply dissatisfied because we do not become wiser and better through them, as is clearly their pretension. For Husserl, the fact that we no longer, uh, that we were no longer moving in the same direction sketched out by this optimal idea of logic suggests 
that a rupture, a constitutive abnormality, so a, a rupture, a constitutive abnormality has ensued, one which we might call a crisis in the, quote, spiritual common good of humanity, end quote. But provided that we want to be more than mere professionals, specialists, and academics, provided that we want to take ourselves as human beings, quote, in the full and highest sense, end quote, we are called upon to, quote, raise ourselves above the self-forgetfulness of the theoretician who knows nothing of his accomplishment and of the motivations compelling him, who lives in them but does not have a thematic view of this accomplishing life itself. End quote. Phenomenology as transcendental philosophy wants to recover the philosophical spirit of logic. The way proposed to do so in these lectures is a genetic one. Though I will say more in section two of the translator's introduction, this, regarding genetic method, let me remark here in a general manner that by clarifying its origins, not as something static, but as origins that are originating, we can recover the lost sense of logic, a sense that remains ob uh, obfuscated in the present sciences. In this way, we are in a position to discover the presuppositions of logic by investigating the genetic formations of sense. Only a transcendental logic can be an ultimate theory of science, for it treats the objects of thought precisely as accomplishments of the activity of thinking. Transcendental phenomenology makes such a theory of science possible because it inquires back, back from the ready-made propositions, from theories already there, to thinking life in which these formations are first accomplished. It goes back still more deeply from the givenness of all types of objects that underlie possible theories to the experiencing life in which those objects are pre-given, and most radically, it understands how the life of consciousness itself can be constituted as a true being, as an ideal correlate of possible verifications. In order to undertake a transcendental logic, quote, tremendous transcendental phenomenological preliminary work must be accomplished, end quote. This preliminary work entails, in part, tracing the accomplishments of thinking to their genetic origins in passive, precognitive syntheses, in moving from the dimension of the constituted to the constituting Husserl incorporates a, re a regressive archaeological movement from the active cognitive dimensions to the passive kinesthetic ones. It is in this sense that the project as it actually took shape in formal and transcendental logic becomes an introduction to and, prepar and preparatory for the analyses. But equally, this beginning re regressive movement so from the ready-made theories that we have back, back, back to the, to, the, to the archaeological grounds of how all of this was first constituted for consciousness. By th this beginning, regressive movement also has to be understood as prepar preparatory for the inverse direction that the analysis will take for their explicative, explicative method. And once we have regressed back to the origins of the great world of constituting life, we describe this life by, quote, be, by beginning from below and ascending upward to show how genuine thinking in all its levels emerges here, how it is motivated and is built up in its founded accomplishment, end quote, from the most basic structures of consciousness, tracing the storied structure of constitution. That's, that's what Husserl says, he's called the, the, so, the storied structure of constitution is what he wants to trace out in a regressive analysis. So he says, the, the analyses undertake the task of a transcendental phenomenological aesthetic as founding, so it's something that's, that's the foundation for, so it's, it is, they take it as founding for a transcendental phenomenological logic. So the analyses undertake the task of a transcendental phenomenological aesthetic as founding for a transcendental phenomenological logic, thus investigating the systematic connections of passive sense formation. 
but we still need to kind of understand what that means, passive sense formation. But it means that you're not thinking of something in order to in order to constitute the objects of thought. Rather, uh, when he says passive synthesis, he means <clears throat> a couple different things. He means, well, we're going to find out what that, what that means. But it has to do with time, temporality, and uh, and uh, your kinesthetic or or what you will later we, we, we today will call your motor uh, motor movements and and uh, your uh, affections and things like this how, how, how your experiences are first of all constant uh, found how our experiences in the world first of all found all the sense that goes into the higher theoretical levels of, of the world something that we're doing today uh, actually uh, in uh, cognitive science, we look at uh, embodied cognition and how the body shapes the mind. <clears throat> he was doing this in the 1920s. Um, only from the sphere of passivity, contends Husserl, can we grasp the most fundamental of all shortcomings in the foundation of traditional logic, one that concerns the validity of logical norms and the ultimate principle of logical norms, namely, the principle of contradiction and the law of the excluded middle. A genetic method allows us to elucidate the dynamic formations of sense in the passive sphere as foundational for logic. For this reason, paradoxically, a critique of the ideal structures of logical reason, reason which, which takes as its point of departure the investigations into a formal and transcendental logic, cannot be limited to the sphere of logic. It demands a transcendental aesthetic. <clears throat> Described as a transcendental aesthetic, the tremendous preliminary work mentioned above entails not merely recovering the foundation for active syntheses and cognitive operations, but of describing the passive sphere of experience in its own integrity, its own essential laws, and contributions in the constitution of evidence and the modalizations of evidence peculiar to it. A transcendental aesthetic within a genetic methodological register will bracket all judicative, um, judicative knowing, determinative, determinative and predicative thought, and focused on the occasion um, on the occurrences of apperception in general the objects of possible perception that have the sense form of time and the sense shape of spatiality and investigate how sense how sense unities are constituted through associative synthesis so once again a transcendental aesthetic within a genetic methodological register will bracket bracket out all judicative knowing determinative and predicative thought and focus and the transcendental aesthetic within a genetic methodological register will focus on the occurrences of apperception in general, the objects of possible perception that have the sense form of time and sense shape of spatiality, and investigate how sense unities are constituted through associative synthesis. It will require investigations into the structure of sensibility as the continual constitution of space and time through self-temporalization in time consciousness and lived bodily kinesthesis. <clears throat> <coughs> Extending to all features of space-time constitution, a transcendental aesthetic will broach even a generative analysis of the constitution of space and time in terms of earth ground and world horizon, investigating life worlds in terms of their normative significance as home and alien. The analyses from the 1920s dealing with passive synthesis did not go this far and stays for all practical purposes on the level of genetic phenomenology, that is, within the span of individual, individual persons, facticity, or the intra-generational intra constitution of community. On the one hand, by understanding the tenor of this genetic methodological movement that underlies the analyses, we have some further philosophical justification for these lectures having acquired their fame 
as, as, as the passive synthesis, passive synthesis lectures. But the explication of passive synthesis does not complete the analyses, since a transcendental aesthetic must ascend upwards to a transcendental logic and thus is situated concretely within the problematic of transcendental logic. Uh, upwards, I think, means more and more... Uh, yeah, well, you'll, 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 you'll understand later. Um, just know that at, at the... He starts uh, with kinesthesis and all, and, the, and then in the passive sphere, which is like the bottom of experience. They're just the most bare, basic temporality and then you know perception of perception and then moves up its way to higher levels of thought so to this extent um, to this extent the rubric of passive synthesis though accurate also misses the broader context of his lectures so this is the title passive synthesis misses he's saying the broader context of, of his lectures this is especially poignant with the inclusion of new manuscript materials that belong to this lecture series. As I will note below, the new material concerns the role of active synthesis and motivation for the constitution of formal ontologies. So not only do you have to consider passive synthesis, but also active synthesis, as well as motivation, which figure into the constitution of formal ontologies. In addition to Husserl's actual introduction. The material that is published here as part three, bearing on active synthesis, demands situating these passive synthesis texts in their original, proper, and broader context, and modifying the title of the edition to reflect this framework, which is why it's called Analyses Concerning Passive and Active Synthesis. To keep a continuity with the Husseriliana edition, its title, and the recognition it has attained internationally under the rubric of passive synthesis, but also to reflect its context and the content of the new material that it completes the lecture series. I have, in consultation with the Husserl archives, archives in Louvain, modified the title of the English edition, Analyses Concerning Passive and Active Synthesis Lectures on Transcendental Logic. Let me now turn to the composition of this edition and what appears under this title. Um, in the next part of the the introduction, uh, as was 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 said in the very beginning, um, Steinbach is going to talk about it's section two. It's gonna, it says section two situates the analyses, this book, or these lectures, in the context of a genetic phenomenology, since it is this methodological approach that, ena that enables the description of phenomena treated in the analyses. So it's pretty important to understand the methodological approach, because it's what enables all the description of the phenomena uh, treated in these lectures. And then in section in section three, uh, he's going to go on to elaborate upon the novel and significant themes of these lectures, which are which are the the, the themes of passivity, affective allure, uh, association, motivation, and the unconscious, and and others. All right.